Hello, William. <laughs> Hello, Tamsin. Glad to be here. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. And um, I've never done anything like this before. Um, I know that you are a very, very seasoned interviewee. So if you're gentle with me, that would be really kind of you. Guaranteed. <laughs> but what I thought we could do um, is just start with a few questions that were just a little bit like us kind of warm. We can't do a physical yeah. warm up or a voice warm up, but we can do a thinking warm up. So we're going to do either or. Okay. Okay. So you have to answer quickly. Yeah. All right. No so thinking. I'm going to give you two options and you have to say the thing that you would pick. Yes. Not you, what you think I think you no. should pick, but what you want. Ready? Got it. Okay. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Wine or beer? Wine. Meat or veg? Meat. Morning or evening? Evening. Tottenham or Arsenal? Neither. <gasps> no, that's not allowed. Um, You've broken the game Tottenham. already. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent answer. Football or rugby? Uh, rugby. Oh. Mm. Rolling Stones or the Beatles? The Stones. Bob Dylan or Leonard Cohen? Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Beethoven Sonatas or Chopin Preludes? Beethoven Sonatas. Camus or Malraux? Camus. Mm. <laughs> you won't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Monet or Michelangelo? Uh, Monet. Shakespeare or Chekhov? Uh, that's tricky. Chekhov. Chekhov or even more? Chekhov. <gasps> <laughs> Swimming or cycling? Not watching. Swimming. Mm. Painting or writing? Writing. Theatre or cinema? Theatre. Dickens or Dostoevsky? Dickens. Live or Zoom? Live. Okay, great. Good. Brilliant answers, very quick. Yes, uh, I, can't, I can't go back and change it. Well, do you want to go back on any of them? <laughs> no, I mean, Shakespeare and Ch Chekhov is a really tricky one, you know, um, but I am in a bit of a Chekhov obsession moment at the moment, so, so, so he's the natural choice. Okay, all right, well, I'll let you have it. Okay. <laughs> so we're here to talk about Trio, yeah. your 16th novel. Um, it is, uh, uh, amazingly, about three people. Yes. Um, it, it came about as a slow kind of burn. There's a, a Chekhov quote, which has always intrigued me, which is that most people, he thinks, lead their most interesting and real lives under conditions of secrecy. And so it got me thinking about secret lives and, and the, 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 if you like, the inner life or the private life that we conceal from the world. And I had this kind of mad idea that I would write three short stories about three people with a secret and then put them in a little slip case and the reader could then read them in any order they wanted so that they kind of created your own narrative. But it seemed to me too much of a gimmick. But that idea bled into the idea of the novel. And so I had three people all with secret lives. And um, I just decided to run with that. But then you have the other Q&As. It takes me about a year to ask who were they? What did they do? What age were they? What were their relationships with each other? And because I worked so much in, in film, and I thought a, a movie set or a movie would be a great place to put these people. So that you've got a novelist, woman novelist, who's married to the film director, the film producer, Talbot Kidd, a uh, man in his 60s, and a very young American actress who's very famous called Annie Vicklund. So the, that's the trio, and they're all involved with the film, obviously some Annie and Talbot in a major way, and Elfrida, the novelist, in a, in a minor way. She's connected through her husband. But it's their inter... They, they meet each other and they, they bounce off each other to a degree, but it's really three, different, three separate stories and the secret lives that they are nurturing um, uh, for various reasons. And it's set in Brighton in 1968 on a sort of swinging 60s movie set, uh, but there are other worlds that are visited as well around that. Uh, why did you choose, I, mean, I know that you wrote your James uh, Bond novel solo and set that in 1969. Why did you go back to 1968? Well, it's a great temptation about setting a, a, a novel in the past or the recent past. It, it, it's, everything is fixed. Um, it doesn't have any built-in obsolescence, which novels set in the, the today or absolutely contemporary uh, would. Um, and I, I, 
I remember 1968, I was 16 in 1968, did my O-levels that year, big event. Um, but in <laughs> fact, it, it, was a, it was an extraordinary year in the world, except here in Britain. <laughs> um, and that's what I think I, attracted me to, to that year, that somehow we were in our little bubble and there's nothing more symbolic of that bubble than the, one of these silly, swinging 60s, wacky, zany movies that we seem to make uh, in the second half of the 1960s. And my film is called Emily Brace Girl's Extremely Useful Ladder to the Moon, which <laughs> is a very silly title, but not as silly as some of the titles that were made. There was a, a film made called 30 is a Dangerous Age, Cynthia. <laughs> and, uh, but the silliest of them all was uh, Anthony Newley's film, Can Hieronymus Merkin Ever Forget Mercy Hump? And find true happiness. So by, <laughs> by those standards, any title has got the word Merkin in it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, by those standards, Emily Bracegirdle is relatively sensible. <laughs> but it's that kind of that they're making this silly film in Brighton, which is a town. One of the characters calls it the Las Vegas of England. You know, your inhibitions are sort of let go. It's racy. Um, it's a bit louche. Um, but in the rest of the world, the Vietnam War is raging. Half a million American soldiers in Vietnam. The Tet Offensive almost got victory for the North Vietnamese. Um, <clears throat> Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. In May and June, there were huge riots in France. There was almost another French Revolution mm -hmm. in Germany. It was another student-led revolution. Uh, a huge upheaval in German society in Italy as well, in Mexico. So the world was going to hell in a handcart. Mm -hmm. And our trio are making this silly film in Brighton. So I wanted that context. And of course, you're right, the, the, the world does impinge on our trio. Um, but um, once I had the idea, it, I was off and running. Did yeah. you find it difficult to, to not go to those big world events, to keep it um, provincial in, in Brighton? Yes, I, 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 I do. They do visit Paris, town yeah. that goes to Paris. Um, and, but it's art's all over, you know, it's finished. Um, They've all gone on holiday, <laughs> and uh, um, but you, you, it kind of creeps in on you the the, the, the events in the world. You know, the, uh, Annie's brothers in Vietnam. Yes. Um, uh, one of the other characters um, knows everything about the assassination of Martin Luther King. So there's kind of whispers in the background, and of course the the reader will realise the, the contrast that I'm trying to establish uh, between this kind of intense private life of these characters and the, the great public events of 1968. Were the, those public events uh, a little like the secrets that were happening in the world that weren't yet touching those people, that the people themselves were hiding from because they were also hiding from themselves? Yes, I think that's true. I mean, I, um, I went to Paris in 1969 and suddenly, you know, wised up to what had been going on the, the year before. But I asked my mother, what, what did we do in the summer of 1968? And we, were, we rented a house in St. Andrews in Scotland, went to the beach, played a bit of golf. You know, um, <laughs> uh, so in a way, it's, it's absolutely right that these events, which uh, kind of changed the world. I mean, I think 1968 is one of these dates like 1848 or 1914 or 1933, where the, there was a kind of tipping point in, in, in world history and human society, but it really was like a secret, you know, um, particularly to a 16-year-old who was waiting for his O-level results. Um, so there, there's a sense in which, but the world, you know, is always with us, and uh, the, the world of the CIA, um, of Vietnam, of the Paris riots, does slowly but surely begin to infiltrate this kind of cosy, rather wacky world of making a movie in Brighton. You've chosen three people to be at the heart of it, two women and a man. I know that you've written from the point of view of a woman and actually the voice of a woman before now in your other works. Uh, why did you choose to have that balance of two women and one man? I honestly don't know. I mean, it's just the story as it begins to take shape in your mind um, seems to uh, demand these things. It's almost uh, unconscious. I mean, for example... Um, Elfrida Wing, my novelist, is very loosely based on a real person called Rosemary Tonks, uh, a name that's uh, pretty much forgotten. But Rosemary Tonks wrote three novels and then disappeared completely off the map. 
and was discovered 50 years later, living under a false name. Uh, she joined some sort of religious cult. And I became very interested in Rosemary Tonk. So when I thought, well, I'm going to have a novelist in the, in the, in the novel, I thought, well, I think a Rosemary Tonks figure would be interesting. And I also became very intrigued by the American actress Jean Seberg, who, mm. was, uh, who had a rackety, unfortunate life. Um, and so my Annie Wicklund is sort of like my Jean Seberg. So these kind of interests, in a way, forced the decisions on me, or not forced, but that led to those decisions. And I have this definition of, of the novel, which is, a novel is the sum of all the things the novelist is interested in at the time of writing. <laughs> so I was interested in um, the Paris riots. I was interested in Jean Seberg. I was interested in Rosemary Tonks. And so I was able to, uh, in the wonderful freedom that the novel gives you, I was able to explore these interests through the characters I invented. Talbot Kidd is a, a man in his 60s who also has a, a secret. Do you think you were less interested in him? No, I, I, I was very interested in uh, Talbot Kidd, um, and I think he's very representative of a certain uh, type of English man who, I'm not giving away too much, is unsure about his sexual nature, let's put it that way. Um, and of course, the other great event was that the, in 1967, the Sexual Offences Act had been passed, and so being gay, um, being homosexual, was no longer illegal. Yeah. And... We forget now, you know, 50 odd years on, how significant that was. But at the time, the shift in, well, the so-called shift in public attitudes that didn't happen overnight was massive. And so that was another uh, liberty, if you like, another liberation, but um, that is explored in, in, the 1960, in my 1968 setting. Yeah. Um I may be bold in saying this, but I don't think you're a woman, and I'm making an assumption. Uh, this also may you're, be bold. You're very sharp-eyed. <laughs> that you're that's not, not no, no, gay. No, no. Uh, that's a bold question. Mm. I may be outing you by no, asking no, that. No. Um, there are some uh, factions out there who would say, particularly as an actor, mm. that if you are not the certain thing that you are playing, you shouldn't be playing that part, mm. particularly in certain you know, political situations. Mm. Do you feel as a novelist that you ever have that pressure that as a, as a white heterosexual male, you shouldn't be writing from the perspective of a woman or a gay man? A absolutely not. I think it's a, a completely fundamental freedom for the novelist uh, to be able to do and write about whatever he or she wants. Um, and to suddenly take away those freedoms uh, would be an act of censorship mm -hmm. or self-censorship even. Um, I, I think you, know, you, you, can, you can write about absolutely anything in the persona of absolutely anybody, but if it's not good, you'll be judged. <laughs> um, if it's good, then it might be very interesting. And um, I don't see why, as a novelist, I should deprive myself of uh, writing about 50% of the human race. And so I've, I've enjoyed changing sex for my novels. I've done it uh, three or four times now. And it's very fascinating to imagine, and it's an act of imagination, what it's like to be a young woman primatologist or a, a, a young woman photographer and see the world through their eyes. Um, and it's part of the stimulation of writing for me. Um, I'm a, you know, I don't use my own life as raw material for my fiction, but I, I, and I send my imagination out as my avatar, you know, whether it's in the past or to historical events or different countries or different people. Um, you know, you could, that argument becomes ridiculous. I couldn't write from the point of view of an 80 year old man because I'm not 80. You know, it, be, it becomes absurd. And so I think novelists, indeed all artists, have the liberty to do and be anybody they want, as long as they do it to the best of their ability and do it well. If it becomes crass or, or stupid or, or um, um, wrong, then they'll be judged and condemned. But you shouldn't be banned from having a go. When you spend time with each of your characters, is there any element of them which invades you so that you feel yourself being changed by them? 
Not really, to be honest. I think I think that is quite a romantic notion of the, that, and people think that you know I I I was taken over by the character and I wrote almost automatically with their voice in my ear. Um, I'm of the other school. I always quote Vladimir Nabokov, one of my favorite writers at this stage, when he was often asked this question. And he said, no, I'm afraid um, all my characters are galley slaves and I'm the man on the deck with a whip. <laughs> so they are my creatures and they do exactly as they're told. And I know uh, exactly what they're going to do and what their fates are and so on. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm in control, you know, okay. and... Um, uh, they never step out of line. Okay, okay, <laughs> wow. So your characters never surprise you? No, because I spend so long, my, my method of writing is particular. I mean, I spend twice as long figuring out the novel I'm going to write as I do writing it. And it's roughly two years thinking, researching, filling notebooks, you know, going up blind alleys and coming back down again. Um, and until only when I know exactly how the novel's going to end, do I start? And that takes half as long as, as a figuring out stage. I have, I've got rather grand names for them. I call period of period of invention and the period of composition. And the period of invention is fun, actually. It's, but, um, and it's, it's a long, drawn-out process. But it's only when I know what my last page is going to be, if you like, or my last paragraph, or even my last line, that I think, right, I can start on page one now. Your three characters, uh, I mean, I, I think three is a really satisfying shape anyway. They say a three-legged stool is one of your most stable um, forms. Yeah. Um, you're, <clears throat> you've, you've set up the structure of the book in three parts. Um, I, am I right to name the three parts? Yeah. That's not going to give too much yeah, away. Uh, so your three parts are duplicity, surrender, and escape. Yeah. Uh, was it significant that you that you chose three parts, which in some way reflected the triumvirate of characters? Yes, and they they all to a degree follow these abstract nouns to a certain extent. Um, and uh, this is a part of the you know the, the the luxurious tinkering you can do at the at the end of a novel and um, you move the parts around and and think about what you're going to call part one instead of just part one. And so I thought these, these names, these words were, were teasing and intriguing. And so um, part of the embellishment of, of the novel, you know, after the event, I mean, I could have called part one, part two, part three, mm -hmm. the novel would be exactly the same, but I, I liked the, the way um, that the words suggested uh, the actions within the pages. And it, in, the, in the book, it's in the physical book itself, that, that those pages are black with the big lettering as a d design feat, I like it very much as well. So um, it's, it's, you know, tr it's called trio, the three characters, the three parts, all these things are neat and, and uh, part of the structure of the, of the novel. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's slightly playful, you know, um, but I, I did spend years and years teaching English literature and, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, and so I, I'm thoroughly steeped in uh, the canon and all the tricks that authors can uh, employ. And so I employ a few myself. So the fact that duplicity, the first part of the three parts, takes you beyond the midpoint of the book. So when you look at the spine, yes. you can see your two black yeah. points in there. The, the first part is bigger than the second, yes. which is bigger than the third. Yes. Was, Visually, did that please you? It, it did please me, and it's also part of the business of the narrative in the sense that you've got three characters and you've got three distinct stories to tell. So the setup is more complex. So inevitably, as you um, describe the secret lives of the three of them in all their texture and detail, it's going to be longer than when they start to act, you know, whether it's to surrender, to give up, and then... So the book picks up pace as well. I think the stories um, accelerate, and um, that's reflected in the relative sizes of the three parts. I think that's very interesting that you that you um, put those two ideas together: the idea of surrender and to act. Mm. Yes, <laughs> that when they start doing yes. rather than being or hiding, uh, then that's the act of surrender. 
this surrendered to the nature, maybe. You know, that's the, it's not doesn't necessarily have to be pejorative. It can be, I'm going to be honest rather than I'm going to be um, duplicitous. So it's, uh, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a loaded word in a way, but yes. it's a kind of admission of the person that they are. Yes, but surrender does have, can have a sense of, uh, of a passive nature. You, sur you give up, you surrender yes. to something, yes. but you, you see it as an active thing. Yes, I think that um, they're all coming to terms with the, the, their secret lives. And so um, it, it, it's a very legitimate sense that if you, if you surrender to your true nature, it needn't necessarily be a bad thing. You know? so, so I think there's, that there, are, there are meanings within the word surrender that I, that I exploit. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, You've talked in the past in other interviews about uh, the polar opposite pull on a writer of uh, uh, between uh, the romantic calling of a novelist and hard graft and discipline. If we were going to do either or, mm. which would be <laughs> your immediate response? Or do you think that they're, that they're in conversation with one another? Well, they are in conversation, but it is, there is a lot of hard graft. And... and um, uh, you know, a medium-sized novel uh, like Trio, which is 350 pages approximately, requires a, a lot of work. You know, I, I wrote it every day for a year. Mm. You know, and then I revised it and wrote more. And, and you, you write in longhand. I write in right? yeah, write pen on paper, and um, and then I transfer it to my computer, and I can edit it on the computer. But um, I think every Every artist and you as an actor, Tam, as, as well, there is a romantic view of, uh, of our pro <coughs> respective professions, and then there's the brutal reality <laughs> of it. And in fact, it's the brutal reality that you're more conscious of. And I think if you surrender to the kind of romantic <laughs> um, version of being a writer, you know, sit down at your desk, wait for inspiration to, to arise, no, nothing will be written. And so it's, it, it's, it, there is a very um, so almost sort of Calvinistic, pragmatic, um, hard graft aspect to your art, you know, as as um, as all artists, you know, throughout history will testify. Um, and I always quote that old um, Fred Astaire line, you know, that if if it looks difficult, you're not trying hard enough. Um, <laughs> and so you want to produce something that seems effortless and seamless, and was always meant to be that way. But it takes a lot of hard work. Yes, I think what's really uh, um, uh, arresting about you, this book and, and your, your, your novels is, is the attention to detail, that uh, you create worlds that are so very detailed, but hold those details very lightly. <laughs> so you're, they're not overladen. So you don't feel burdened by, um, by the world that you're being invited into. And the thing that I have felt... I think for the past three of your novels that I've, that I, when I finish them and I put them down, I have a sense of melancholy right. <laughs> that I'm not going mm. to be around those characters anymore. Um, what do you feel about that, about letting go of, of that attention to detail and those characters that you have, that you've created because they didn't exist before you brought them into being? Yes, I mean, I, 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 you know, it's nearly 40 years since my first novel was published, but I can remember it vividly. I could almost list the characters' names of it. You know, do you think? So they're very present to me. Um, I can imagine any one of my characters walking into this room, for example. Um, and I think that's because I am a realistic novelist. Um, I, I do play a few tricks, um, and my short stories are perhaps a bit more experimental sometimes, but I, I am squarely in that broad river, that broad tradition of realism. If I was a painter, I'd be a figurative painter, mm -hmm. not an abstract painter. And so when you're creating a world, when you're inventing a world, inventing people, what you have to do is make them you know, live and breathe or make those worlds uh, absolutely uh, possible to be visualized or, or felt. And again, that, that takes uh, you know, hard work and there are, there are tricks you have to make it uh, work better. And I think I've learned them as I've, as I've written. But um, the, uh, the point of the, the, the book succeeds in a way if when you finish it, uh, you, ha you haven't forgotten it and that, you're, that, that scenes or people uh, still haunt you or, or are still memorable because 
for me, that means that I had created a world that was so real that you almost forgot it was fictive. And I think it's one of the things that I've done throughout my writing career is exploit that very blurry frontier between the fictitious and the real. And I try to push my fiction into the world of the real so that readers have a moment's <laughs> doubt about, you know, did you know, John James Todd actually exist or did... Um, did Nat Tate, did Nat Tate actually. actually. That's, yes. that my Nat Tate hoax was where perhaps where I pushed it so far into the other world. That, now, uh, let me ask you, know. you something about that, because mm. you talk about not being able to begin your novel until you know how it's going to end, mm. that you have a very clear sense of where you're headed, what your destination yeah. is. Um, when you wrote your novel about Nat Tate, can I call it a novel? Yes, I call it a novel, even though it's only 80 pages long. Yes. There's been enough stuff around it for 10 novels. So it's, uh, <laughs> but it's had more life after it. Yes. than you could ever have imagined. So there is an element, and this I don't think this is a, is a negative thing, but there is an element of control in the sense that, you know, a ballet dancer has, an, has mm. a super element of control about the way that you, uh, the way that you work, but the way that you invite your readers in to experience what you've mm. worked on is that your head is somewhere very particular. You couldn't have known what was going to happen around Nat Tate. So does that make you feel nervous because you're no longer in control of it well in a sense it's true of all your novels because um, the relationship between the any reader and the author is unique and 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 one-on-one -on -one. and you, you one you say here is my here is my novel but you don't know what any reader is going to take from it um, mm -hmm. and or be affected by um in in the, you know in the case of nat tate where i invented this this painter um couldn't do it now because it's before the age of Google, but I invented a painter. <laughs> we produced, um, my publisher was David Bowie. Uh, we produced this beautiful- That's such a great story. I know, I'm going to just, can we just say that, <laughs> that sentence again? Like, my <laughs> publisher was David <laughs> Bowie. Bowie. He said very casually. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> and um, it, it, uh, my plans for the book, and indeed his plans for the book, were very different from what actually happened. Uh, and I can very quickly run through it that we, we produced this little book about this fake painter. There was a glittering party in New York in the studio of Jeff Koons, the, the pop artist. Uh, Bowie read extracts from the book. He wrote, he wrote the bur blurb to the book as well, which is how cool is that? Um, and we waited to see what happened. And we both thought that it would be a kind of slow burn. It was a very elaborate hoax. And I, I um, all sorts of things that I did to make it convincing, I think, were working. But uh, I thought it'd be a slow burn, and in six months' time, I'd be exposed. You know? <laughs> but in fact, what happened was that at this party, one of the conspirators went around asking questions of the, uh, of the glamorous guests, who all claimed to have heard of Matt <laughs> Tate, as one does. And it became, it, he, blew, he was a journalist, and he it blew it wide open four days later. And it became a 24-hour news event. And that was, that was 1998. Um, April Fool's Day, 1998, <laughs> and um, and it's still rumbling on. You know, it's just been translated into Italian. The Italian press has been full of articles about Nat Tate. It is completely out of my control now. Um, and so I am like, as I say, I'm like Dr. Victor Frankenstein, and, and Nat Tate is my monster who I've created, and he's out there roaming the world. Yeah, and he I wants can, a wife. <laughs> that's exactly. <laughs> cannot bring him back, drive a stake through his heart. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you interested in this novel, in addiction? Um, well, I think uh, we're talking about Elfrida in particular. Well, I think uh, yes, I'm talking yes, about all yes, three um, of them. Yes, they are. Yeah. Um, maybe because I've known a few addicts in, in my time, and um, I think I can understand how easy it is to to fall prey to an addiction of, of any of any kind, you know, even a benign addiction. Um, and also, uh, is a, in a more general sense, um, Henri de Monterland, the French novelist, came up with this great phrase, which I always repeat to myself, you know, happiness writes white on the page. You cannot write a novel about a really nice person who's incredibly happy and everything goes well for them. 
that person. It would just be too dull. So you need things to go wrong. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in, in this novel, in addiction, that it's the addictions, in a way, of the three characters that provide the problems in their life and therefore makes their stories all more interesting and easier for me to write. So I think it's just uh, just uh, part, you know, all my characters uh, in all my novels are tested one way or another. Um, things go wrong and they have to fall back on their resources as human beings to see whether they surmount them or not. Um, and so I think it's, a, it's part and parcel of storytelling. You know, um, Little Red Riding Hood goes into the, into the woods to deliver some food to a granny and meets a wolf. You've got a story. You know, um, if you delivered the food to the granny and had tea and came home, it wouldn't be so interesting. So I think in, in a way it's about, it's about putting obstacles and barriers and problems in, in front of these characters you've invented and how they cope with them or how they respond to them tells you a lot about them. They become real, become three-dimensional. <laughs> so these three-dimensional characters that you create, that live then with you, do you, are you ever moved by them? Do you ever find yourself thinking a thing or writing a thing and, and being moved by it? Well, to a degree, I mean, it's, I am I'm the man on the deck with the whip, and so, my, so I'm, I'm not sympathising with the, my galley slaves that much, but I occasionally um, almost, you know, empathise with them. And I remember in particular when I wrote my novel, Any Human Heart, um, and I knew it was a story of a man's life through the 20th century. He, he's, he lives in every decade of the 20th century. He peaks early, and it's a long slide downhill to his... 80s, um, and I knew exactly how he was going to die and, and where he was going to die. Um, and I'd planned it all out and it fitted into the structure of the novel and so on and so forth. But when Logan Mount Stewart, which was his name, eventually died, and I wrote that page in my, in my notebook and, and wrote about Logan's death, I, I did come downstairs to the kitchen and said to Susan, my wife, Logan has gone, <laughs> as if, you know, a dear friend of ours had <laughs> passed away. And I, I did feel a bit odd at that stage because I had written 500 pages of his life. I knew every single aspect of it, of course, because I'd invented it. Um, and but it was I, his journal. It is, and it's written as a journal, mm. so in the first person, an intimate journal. He tells you everything. Um, so there was, a, in that case, a real, not identification, but a familiarity. And so when I, as it were, finished him off, I had a little qualm, maybe, a little pang. Um, but, uh, you know, then it was back to, back to work and revising the pages. Was that, was that like killing a monster? Um, no, because he wasn't a monster, Logan. But In he, the yes, sense and of, I, of I, Yes, exactly. But I sort of, I arranged a very good death for him, um, <laughs> which is um, what we all wish for, in fact. Um, and um, uh, it, it, it's... It was, you know, it was one of those few instances where, if you like, my ruthless um, control slipped slightly, and I thought of, for a, for a moment, maybe thought of Logan Mount Stewart as a real person who had shuffled off his mortal coil, you know. <laughs> but of course, he wasn't. <laughs> so these names: Logan Mount Stewart, Brody Moncur, Elfrida Wing, mm. Rodrigo Tipton, yes. all those things, yes. really Reggie, yes. and Annie Vickland and Talbot Kidd. And then, of course, there's a fabulous character, um, Ken Kincaid. Yes. Bethany Melmoth. Um, why are none of your characters called like Bob or, well, or Teresa? <laughs> some of them are. Some of them, <laughs> but the, I think it's, it's a, one of these tips that I pass on to people that, um, uh, that if you name a character well, then that character is almost living on the page. And I think if you call a character a perfectly nice, normal name like Sally Brown or, um, you know, um, Richard Simpson, um, <laughs> it's very difficult for me to visualize that person. I don't need to go, you don't need to go the full Dickensian hog, um, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Um, but if you give your character a slightly strange or memorable name, as many people have 
memorable names, Tams and Greg. <laughs> um, <laughs> William Boyd <laughs> yes. is, is, is slightly less... Uh, yes, a bit boring. No, <laughs> no, but, I, no, I, no I, but it's I, true. I, but it, in, the, in the work of fiction, um, you know, for example, I wrote a novel about a, a film director called uh, John Todd, which is quite... A, I actually call him John James Todd, mm -hmm. which makes him interesting. John and James are, you know, not particularly interesting names on their own, but yoked together... Um, suddenly John James Todd has a ring to it. And um, it's uh, just something I do. Um, and it, it's, uh, if you just open a, any telephone directory if such things exist anymore <laughs> and look at all the strange names in, you know, and uh, you'll see that juxtaposition of a Christian name and a surname. And I do this for foreign characters as well. You know, French characters, German, Ita Italians. I try to find a, a similar... Italian version, slight, ever so slightly unusual, so that it sticks in your mind. So you visualise your characters. Can you see them? Totally, yes. I think because I'm, as I say, I'm an unapologetic, realistic novice, I have to know the colour of their eyes, what they had for breakfast, you know, how tall are they, can they drive, you know, uh, all these sorts of details um, go into a kind of dossier that I... You know, Compile sometimes a physical dossier. I jot them down if there's a lot, a lot of characters in in the book. Um, but I have a very very clear sense of their physical presence or their physical aspects. And do you cast them in your head for eventual for an eventual film? Yes. No, I never do that. I never do that because you're bound to be disappointed. <laughs> um, so I never. And I never write a novel with any kind of film or TV adaptation in mind either, um, because it would be a 60-page novel if I did. Um, so I think it's the world of the novel, pure and simple, and um, I know exactly the type of person they are. I can imagine Elfrida Wing sitting at that table, what she'd be wearing, and how she'd be feeling, and what she'd order to drink. You know, So uh, it's... Um, it's just part and practice, I think, of creating a world and creating characters that live and breathe. And you, as a novelist, can do a lot to bring that about. So when your works have been uh, translated into other forms so that they've been mm. televised or made into films, um, I know that you like to do the, the, the screenplay for those. Are you then also involved in who you want to play the characters? Yes, I'm, I, I really like... The collaboration of film and television and theatre, and um, it's it's so different from the perfect autonomy of writing a novel, where you're on your own and it's your decision basically. So I like that collegiate sharing aspect, and one of the reasons I like to write the screenplays of my adaptations of my own novels is that I'm you know involved in the process of the of that film or that series from start to finish, and. You know, I'm ex very experienced now. I've had 20 films uh, produced, and um, I know that I know the industry. I know its demands and its challenges. So I'm not precious or or, or shrill. Or I don't throw my toys out of the, out of the pram. <laughs> but I do have strong opinions about who would who would be right for that character, and um, so I I, I I do contribute to the debate. Um, and um, you suggested. Am I right in saying Daniel Craig for for uh, one of your pieces, and he was, and that was really against. Yes, type. I, I was. Ad I adapted Evelyn Waugh's uh, trilogy, the Sword of Honor trilogy, for um, a, a mini series, I suppose you'd call it now. Um, and the, like a, a lot of Waugh's novels, the central character, um, Charles Ryder in Bride's Head, or Tony Last in A Handful of Dust, or Guy Crouchback in the Sword of Honor. Trilogy is is a bit of a wet actually. It's a bit of a weed, um, and yes, uh, and, so, mm. and so and <laughs> so when sort of on a trilogy, which is story of World War Two, and at its heart, people forget there is a a real love story, mm -hmm. and I thought you can't have three hours of television with a slightly you know epicene passive character, and so counterintuitively, I said that we need a real man to play. Guy Crouchback, and I had just worked with Daniel Craig in the only film I've directed, and so uh, I, I had come to know him very well, and I think he's a brilliant actor. And 
he is actually superb as Guy Crouch back. And yeah. I think it's, in a way, slightly out of his comfort zone to play a sort of upper middle class English gent. But he, he did it fantastically well. And of course, the love story, which is very tragic at the heart of it, um, is all the more powerful because it's utterly credible. Um, Brenda, uh, not Brenda, I can't remember the character's name, um, Virginia is very flighty and uh, she has another man's child, has an affair, has another man's child, a particularly loathsome creature who Guy Crouchback hates. But Guy Crouchback takes the child on as his own after the war. And um, it's fantastically powerful. At the end of, this, of, the, of the series, there's Daniel, you know, rugged Daniel with his little baby in his arms and the music is soaring, not a dry eye in the house. It's absolutely, <laughs> so I think I was absolutely vindicated, but it was more, again, it was a pragmatic decision to do with the nature of television or film that you can't have a central character who is vacuous. He has to have sort of dynamism and, and you have to be absolutely glued to and compelled by that character. And, and as War wrote Guy Crouchback, he isn't compelling, it wouldn't be compelling on screen. Perfectly good in a novel, mm -hmm. but not on screen. Mm -hmm. I want to just ask a little bit about one of your trio, Elfrida in mm -hmm. particular, uh, uh, because she's a novelist. And there seem to be some interesting elements in there about the nature of being a novelist. Um, you have always talked in the past about um, the robust use of imagination. Mm. And that's what you do. That's your tool. And that's what you're, you're using every day when you sit down and write a thousand words by hand mm. every day. Um, do you think it's curious that you have used this fabulous tool of yours, your imagination, to create a character who has writer's block? So you <laughs> are imagining, using your imagination to imagine what it mm. would be like not to be able to use your imagination. Yes, it is a bit of a paradox, isn't it? It, it is a, a fear, I think, that every novelist has. And I have novelist friends who have suffered from writer's block and haven't, haven't written a novel for seven years and things like that. And I, 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 it's, it's an awful thing to contemplate, to sit down at your desk and think, well, I'm ready to write another novel and have no ideas or to make a start and you realize it's, it's not working. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is the, the kind of the ailment, the, the malady that sort of obsesses novelists, I think. Um, and um, so it's not hard for me to imagine what it would be like not to be able to imagine, you know. And, uh, um, and so I gave this problem to Elfrida. Um, it's compounded by other things as well, but there's, she hasn't written a novel for 10 years. And it's a real issue, a real problem for her. And uh, in, in the course of Trio, she begins to think that inspiration is returning. But I can imagine um, almost anything. You know, um, I can imagine being burned alive, or I can imagine being a, um, a young soldier, you know, going over the top of the Battle of the Somme if I set my mind to work. And I think it's a cr one of the three crucial ingredients of being a novelist. Um, you, you need to, uh, I think, you, you need to um, be able to write. This sounds stupid, but it's true. <laughs> you need to be able to let readers have to understand what you're trying to say. You can do, you can do that very simply. Or you can do it in a very complicated way. But you need to, to be able to have that ability. You, I think you also have to take a, an enormous pleasure in the textures of everyday life. But, you know, an, an eight-hour delay at an airport is... You know, at least two short stories. You know, so um, <laughs> if you're not interested in the world around you in the cinema of everyday life, I don't really think you can write a good novel. And then the third factor is, you must be able, you must have a well-functioning imagination. Um, otherwise, you're just going to write about yourself all the time. And I think, you know, you can learn uh, the, the other two things. Uh, you can learn to observe. You can learn how to write. But I don't think you can learn how to have imagination. I think it's a gift. And you either have it or you don't. Um, and so I think with, if you, you could probably just about get by with two out of the three, but probably the most important one is your imagination, imagining, empathizing, sympathizing, um, particularly if you're not using your own life and circumstances as raw material. Mm -hmm. There's one part in your, in your novel where you talk about Elfrida. You, you said about her feeling that she, she's been inspired to 
to, to write mm. again after this, this 10 year break. And, uh, and you write, um, Elfrida's heart was bumping, sure that her life was going to change which is a really physical, you can feel a kind of fizzing going on inside her. Is that what inspiration feels like to you? I think do you it, feel it physically? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you do feel something. I mean, it's very hard. You, you, your heart may not be thudding in, in its, uh, it, um, as you write, but there's no doubt that that act of creation is, is highly stimulating. I just finished writing a short story, which I wrote over the last three days, and it, it was commissioned, and so I thought, oh, God, I better write it. You know, so I, I thought it all out. out and, but the actual pleasure of writing it uh, is intense, and particularly if you feel it's going well. And the other thing that happens, you have no sense of time passing. You could, you could be there, three hours might seem like three minutes. You know, it's very funny how you lose yourself. So there is a, there is a physical process of, of creating when you're writing, and then you, you stop, you revise, you cross things out, and have third thoughts and fourth thoughts. But there's no doubt that the, that moment of, um, of putting black on white, um, uh, of, of uh, writing the words and, and creating a narrative and, uh, and creating a, uh, it's a Bethany Melmoth short story, in fact, um, <laughs> a character I've used many times. Um, but it's, uh, it's, there, is a, there is a physical correlation, I think, and it's, it, you, you're always feeling quite a good mood which is nice, you know. Um, you, feel, you feel sort of happy in a way that you, in, this is what, what I do and I've done it and I'm pleased with it, you know. So it's a, there is a very curious um, quid pro quo operator. <laughs> do you, so do you ever sit down and write things and are not happy with what you've done? Well, this is why I think why I've concocted my special method in that I don't start until I've sorted out all the problems and uh, realize that this sub-theme is not working, so I should dump it, or um, this character is, is redundant or is not coming alive or is self-indulgent or something. So in, in my period of inspiration, period of invention, I, in a way, get rid of all the things, theoretically, that could go wrong during the period of composition. And it's exactly with this little short story, which is well, not so little, it's 4,000 words, but. I, I knew I had to write it, and I and I spent a long time thinking of the story, and thinking of it where it balanced, where it would be set, what would happen, um, and I, I in a way I, the technique I overloaded it. I had too much stuff, and so I had to junk some of my ideas um, because I would have written an eight thousand word short story, which was not required. And um, so I, I organized my bits and pieces uh, on the table to tell this story. And once I was sure I knew how it was going to end, I sat down and wrote it over, over the last two or three days. And, you know, was in quite a good mood. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever go back to stuff? Do you leave it and then go back to it? Um, yeah, I, I do. I mean, in, in a novel um, which takes, you know, a year to write, um, at the end, when you get to the end, I've very often gone back to the beginning and thought, no, nah, that's not quite working. As I, and I rewrite, mm. often rewrite beginning. Um, but I don't put it aside for a year and then pick it up again. Um, but I, I do write right through to the end. Um, the, you know, some novelists stop, start, go back, revise. Um, D.H. Lawrence, for example, um, wrote start to finish. And if he wasn't happy with what he'd written, he'd start again, you know, um, and write another novel, uh, the same novel again. And I wouldn't go down that road. That's because he hadn't had the period of invention, you see. <laughs> and, uh, um, but uh, I, I do revise. And, I, of course, I, when I adapt my own novels, often many years after they've been written, I have to revisit them as a, as a, with my kind of screenwriter spectacles on. And so I, I do revisit my books um, Quite a lot. In fact, I've written adaptations of virtually all of my novels, but only f five have actually hit the screen. Um, <laughs> but um, so I do. I do look back, and sometimes I'll take a, a, an older novel off the shelf, open it at random, read two or three pages, and think, "How the hell did I do that?" Um, you know, you you, you reencounter your yourself as a younger writer, and um, you remember. The, the, how those pages were written, where the ideas came from. 
Um, but I'm not a compulsive re-reader of my earlier work because I'm you know, constantly thinking about the next book to write. You say about your last novel, um, Love is Blind, that you found that you were writing uh, with distinctly late 19th century sensibilities and tropes, that you felt that you needed to be in that world and to write in a particular way. Did you find that you were doing that with Tria, that you were writing in that decade of the 1960s, the language and the rhythms and the style? Not so much the, the style. I think it's very much my voice, but you are conscious whenever you, you go back in time, you're very conscious of all sorts of anachronisms um, and, and details. Um, uh, you know, it's set in Brighton in 1968, and Brighton today is a dramatically different mm -hmm. town from what it was then. And so you have to, you know, I, I revisited, you know, in my imagination, I've got many street maps of Brighton and old photographs. And so you have to kind of time travel in a way. And that applies to the, the language people use and the, and the, the habits that people had. Um, uh, you know, everybody smoked in 1968. Um, pubs were horrible places. Um, <laughs> so you have to kind of um, imaginatively, you know, journey back and, and you know, quite consciously sometimes uh, you look at the language used and say, that's too contemporary, you know, um, and uh, try to er eradicate any anachronisms, not just details like, does the Grand Hotel have an underground par car park or not? Mm -hmm. um, um, but um, would people actually say that? Um, and very often you're surprised at what people would say, particularly in the, in the context of swearing, for example. Uh, everybody has always sworn. Um, and when I directed my one film, which is called The Trench, which is set in World War I trenches, I said to the young actors, including uh, Mr. Daniel Craig, I said, feel free to swear, use all the four letter words you want. I'm not gonna write them down in the script, but if you want to throw in a four letter word, just do it because soldiers swear like troopers. And of course <laughs> it's incredibly realistic. And I have documentary proof so to back this up. This isn't just a hunch. And so, you know, the air is blue in my film, but it's absolutely accurate. And so that's the sort of thing you want to get right, you know, and so um, that's so where the hard graph comes. So how do you get it right with, the, with what people are saying in 1968? Is it, is it remembering? Is it well, the imagination? Or do you use... Well, uh, I think I, I would... What I do do uh, is I go back to novels in particular that were written in 1968. And of course, you didn't have the liberties that you have today. So there are, um, you know, um, people didn't swear as much in novels in 1968 as they do, as they do now, for example. Um, but you can pick up details and uh, little aspects of life which are there unconsciously because the novel was written at the time. This applies to the 19th century as well. You know, if you, if you want to know what it's like to, to, to what, what was the private personal life of, a, of, a, of somebody in 1830? Well, the thing to do is probably look at letters that were written or look at journals that were written. Mm -hmm. And you might get a glimpse of what people were thinking. It's surprisingly like today. Um, for example, uh, there are amazing series of letters between James Joyce and his wife, Nora which were designed to sexually stimulate them both. And these letters have been preserved. Um, 1909, 1908, it's astonishing, mm -hmm. but it's like a window opening on the private life of James Joyce and Nora. So you, you, you need that evidence if you're going to be bold in that way. You can't just say, I think that's what <laughs> so, um, yes. so I, you know, I, and I, you know, I spent a long time at university not completing a PhD thesis, so I do know how to research things. So I can pretty much find out what I want um, through other books and other texts. Um, and of course, 68, there's a lot more film available. Yes. Know, so so uh, 
uh, you know, you, you, you do your due diligence in trying to get the textures and the details absolutely right. And did you find that um, in the way that the, the dialogue was um, being um, textured by the decade, did you find that your prose was similarly? Not really, not, not the expository prose, um, because that's just the way I write. And if you're saying, you know, he walked into the room and mixed himself a drink, you don't need to write that in a, in a period way. But whenever there's dialogue, I think then your, your antennae have to be t well tuned because people would say certain things, you know, maybe people, people more polite, you know, um, uh, less colloquial, that sort, of, that sort of detail you want to get right. But in, in, the, in, the, um, exposit in the exposition, I just write as I would write anyway. It's the same when I wrote my James Bond novel, Solo. Um, you know, you can read, I read all of Fleming's novels um, in chronological order, and you know Fleming is not a good writer. Um, <laughs> let's, let's not beat about the bush. It was a huge effort for him. It's like getting blood from a stone, and you can see. I mean, the early Bond novels are not bad, but as they get on, they are pretty terrible. Um, so to write like Ian Fleming would have been a huge blunder. So you take all the detail of his Bond and you plonk it down in your novel and you write the descriptions and the action in your voice, but you know, with, with Fleming's uh, model, if you like, in your mind. So are you conscious that you, it's you, William Boyd, who's the storyteller? Yes, so I think I don't have a, uh, you know, I, I try to write as well as I possibly can. You know, I, I take tremendous care over my prose, but I'm not a stylist, I don't, I don't, I don't have a, instantly recognizable style quite deliberately um, it's um, I, I, write, I try to write as you know as limpidly and as well as I can and I always do make this comparison bringing up old James Joyce again that you have the the James Joyce of his short stories the Dubliners which are a model of clear expository prose um, and then you have James Joyce of Ulysses where the style is absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. um, there's no saying one is better than the other. It's a choice you make as a writer. And because I'm a realistic novelist, I, I want to write in a way that the world of my novel is immediate, immediately apprehensible. So I choose to write in that way, but I do take enormous care and you know, burnish the sentences to the best of my ability, try to make them, you know, when you do need to write something evocative, you know, your language maybe, rises up a notch or two um, but it's, that's part of the textures of the of the prose and it's 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 very deliberate you know um, so it's uh, so it's, yes the, 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 i i have a style but it's not a it's not in your face yes uh, i'd like to look at a few of your sentences right if that's all right <laughs> yes, yes far away, far away. <laughs> i mean you led us down <laughs> right, that right. road um so i'm just going to read out a couple of well three sentences that I've, that I've picked from, from Trio. Um, uh, this is uh, regarding um, Talbot Kidd uh, when he meets his son Humphrey, yeah. who is a timpanist. Yes. And he goes to see him in concert. Um, and you write, father and son engaged in genial conversation, Talbot thought, imagining some invisible witness watching them. A little bit later on, uh, you are talking about Elfrida in conversation with her agent, Calder. And Elfrida says, people are opaque, utterly mysterious. Even those dearest to us are closed books. If you want to know what human beings are like, what's going on in their heads behind those masks we all wear, then read a novel. And then later on, towards the end of the book, Elfrida is looking out over the English countryside. And she's seeing how the countryside has been changed by various human developments. And you write, uh, pulled into a kind of shapeliness, random nature subdued by an easy, unthreatening order. So those three sentences struck me <laughs> about maybe what it is to be a writer. Do you see yourself as a witness a seer beyond the masks, and someone who brings order to chaos? 
Well, I think yes, in 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 a, in a humble sort of way. Um, I think um, you know, as Vladimir Nabokov, to quote him again, said, "What you're what you're trying to to do when you write a novel is create a work of art, like all artists, painters, sculptors, musicians, etc. Um, you're trying to create something that is you know enduring, that somehow." Uh, crystallizes this vague experience we have, this strange adventure that we're on in this on this small planet circling its insignificant sun. <laughs> so there is a sense in which there, that that a, a novel is a kind of distillation of the human condition, and that's what the, where the art comes in. But there's another aspect of the novel which I think is absolutely crucial, and something I've that sort of dawned on me uh, more recently. And that people are mysterious, people are opaque, and in a way this is a theme of Trio, that we all have an inner life that is ours exclusively. Um, you can reveal some of it to, to your loved ones if you want, but what's whizzing around in your brain is in, intensely private and inaccessible. Um, and however well you know someone, you can't know what they're thinking. You think you know what they're thinking, but you can't know for sure. And funnily enough, the only place where you have miraculous access to the inner lives of human beings is in a novel, because the novelist has written it and can guarantee that that's what <laughs> Elfrida Wing was thinking as she ordered her fifth gin and tonic. So it's a very curious thing about the novel, I think, and I think it explains its allure, and I think it explains why it will last, because it's, this life we lead is mysterious and baffling and contradictory, and of course it can be very hard and cruel and absurd. Um, and um, if you want to sort of see how other people are getting along with it, a novel is a surprisingly good place, a good novel is a surprisingly good place to go. And you can find out what Elizabeth Bennet thinks about Mr. Darcy by reading Jane Austen. And you know that that's exactly what she was thinking. And you can't get that in real life, <laughs> but you can get it in art. So I think that's what I'm going, what I mean by that when Elfrida gives her little, she's a bit surprised by her eloquence um, <laughs> when she says this but to her agent. that's what you think? Yes, I think, it's what I think, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's when, when, when one comes to think about it, it's, uh, it's very true because, well, here's a question for, for you, Tam. I think on stage, an actor can get very close to revealing the inner life of a character but not quite as detailed and nuanced as you can in a novel. Certainly in a film, you know, it's, a photogra it's photography. It's a, 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 you're looking at somebody's face and they may be saying something, you might hear a bit of voiceover, but compared to the intricacy of detail that you can get in a novel, you can't come close to, to that on film. Uh, maybe, you just, maybe, maybe on stage you can, maybe... Hamlet, when he says to be or not to be, that is a question. You're getting his, you're getting in his soliloquy, you're getting exactly what he's thinking. But we don't have many soliloquies in the theater today. <laughs> um, but you have many, many soliloquies, if you like, in any novel. And in this novel, you have the inner lives of three people laid out for your inspection in incredible detail. And you can see all their ups and downs and backtracking and reversals and uncertainties and so on. And it's miraculous, you know, um, you can't get that in, in real life. And so I think it's a real power of the novel to be able to deliver this access to other people's inner lives. So um, uh, Talbot Kidd in this says, um, I see everything, nothing escapes me. Is, is... That's, a, that's a, a foolish brag. <laughs> 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 um, but is there an element of, of what you do? in there that well, you see everything well i see everything and then i can make it up you know that's the, that's the diff that's the difference I, i'm i'm also a, a human being who, uh, who you know, bumbling through life like the, like the rest <laughs> of us making you know errors and getting things wrong and uh and interpreting things in, in in the wrong way but in in my novels i'm you know master of the universe and um everything i write is absolutely guaranteed cast iron 
carved in stone because I made it up. That's a, that's a funny paradox about it. Um, and if you if, if you're a serious writer, if you're um, a serious literary novelist, your ambitions are precisely that to somehow make sense or paint a picture of the human predicament in a way that appeals to other people and the way that other people can understand it and, and relate to it. So um, that's the, the process, your, your fundamental process you're engaged in. Um, towards the end of the novel, um, Talbot experiences a moment of crisis, a kind of tremor. I'm not going to give mm. anything away, but it's a, it's a moment, a tremor, where he's he can choose what's going to happen mm. next. And into his head comes a line, which he doesn't know mm. is T.S. Eliot, but the line that comes into his head is, the awful daring of a moment's surrender. Yes. And it's very lovely that he can't, he can't quote the source. Yes, he yes. thinks it may be a song. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, an awful daring of a moment surrender. What would your moment be? Well, um, who, who, who knows? Um, I, I think it was, pr to, to be honest, it's probably um, the, when I met my wife, Susan, at, uh, at, we were very young, and um, there was a there was there was a moment when, not so much uh, me, but she could have gone one way or the other way, and so I, I let her make her mind up. And wise person that she was, she chose me. <laughs> but that was a real risk on my part because, you know, I I, I might have lost her. Uh, you know, if she'd gone to, to this other guy, um, and so it's a. Uh, there's a very interesting moment in my life where I, uh, everything was at a tipping point, if you like. It was, it was a kind of forking path, if you like. Um, and my life would have changed you know, irrevocably. And there, in fact, everybody's life is full of moments like that. But they're only usually visible in, with hindsight. <laughs> as, you, as you forge on into the, the sort of void that is the future, you, you don't know that it's all forking paths. But when you look back, and this is another one of my big themes, you see how lucky you were that you went to the theatre that night and met that person, or <laughs> how lucky it was that you didn't get that job. You know? And so you see all the forking paths in your life, and you realise what a random, haphazard business it is. Um, but there are moments where, where you perhaps do see the forking path, and that's when the awful daring the awful comes daring. in, you know, and Talbot is, a, is in exactly, a, a do I dare, whereas another, um, another T.S. Eliot, do I dare peel a peach, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, uh, shall I wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled, <laughs> um, it's, uh, but it's, there are moments in your life, um, it's not like what shirt shall I wear today, but where you realize that everything could change, yeah. and it is kind of intense. <laughs> I'd just like to read the, the two quotes that you put at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the novel. One is Anton Chekhov, one is Albert Camus. Interestingly, uh, both have the same initials. Mm. We're quite right, <laughs> I hadn't, <laughs> hadn't picked up on that, but you're absolutely. Uh, yeah. Anton Chekhov said, most people live their real, most interesting life under the cover of secrecy. And Albert Camus, writes, there is only one serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Deciding whether or not life is worth living is to answer the fundamental question in philosophy. All, all other questions follow from that. So I have two final questions right. for you. Can you share with me a secret? Um, I can't. Splutter, splutter. Um, Do you want to think about that one while um, I ask you the next question? Or I'm trying to think of a there? secret I'd be, pre be, prepared, be prepared to share. To. To, to share. Um, uh, I want, I mean, this is, I, I still get go hot and cold about this. Um, I think uh, when I was at school, I was, this is at Gordonson. This is Gordonson. I behaved extremely badly on a um, tennis tour to Edinburgh. And I stayed out all night um, and was discovered by the tennis coach. And it was a huge scandal. Um, and I told... How old were you? I was 18. 
And in order to get out of this scandal, I told a whopping lie <laughs> to my housemaster and uh, all the people in authority who were rebuking me. And um, this whopping lie would have been exposed very easily if my witness, if you like, didn't corroborate it. And for about three days, I couldn't get hold of this witness. And so I lived in a state of almost permanent panic that my whopping lie was going to be discovered. And I would probably have been expelled, I think. Um, but phew, I wasn't. My lie wasn't discovered. And I was merely demoted <laughs> for a term. Um, and it, there, that is a secret, because um, I've never written about it. And um, I think maybe two or three people, other people who were involved in my, you know, my very badly behaved night out in Edinburgh in 1969 or whenever it was, um, know about the, the circumstances. But I, I, I did tell a lie and almost got found out. Um, and I, I'm, I'm breaking out in a slight muck sweat <laughs> now, <laughs> flashing back. <laughs> so there so, you are. There's, our, a, there's a secret. Our viewers there will, will not know the details of that lie. However, <laughs> I'll be staying on a little longer with William and I'll find out. <laughs> so the final question then is, based on the, uh, the, the Camus quote, do you think life is worth living? Yes, I do. Absolutely. And, and I think it's a very... It's a very interesting quote, that, like, it's very provocative, um, and your instant reaction is to disagree with it. Um, but um, it's, when you think about it a bit longer, it's the quality of your life that is uh, vital, and that can be defined in any way. You don't have to be rich and famous to have a good quality of life. Um, but when you, when, when you find your quality of life is so diminished that life isn't worth living, what do you do? And that's exactly the question um, that Elfrida has, interestingly, in that she puts that question to herself. Um, and so I think Camus' point is actually a very interesting you know, philosophical point that actually has a bearing on our lives rather than just on the language we use or concepts and so on. It's a very he was that kind of a man. I'm very interested in Camus. Um, and uh, I knew somebody who knew him quite well, funnily enough. My, my, um, one of my, my literary agents was a Frenchman. And he knew Camus as a, when, he, when Georges was a young man, he knew Camus before he died in a car crash, very young, I think in his 40s when he died. Um, but um, it's, he, his philosophy, and he wrote works of philosophy, are always very cogent in the sense that they have a real bearing on the lives we all lead. You know, that's what makes it interesting. That's what I think moral philosophy is intriguing. Do the right thing. What is the right thing? These questions come up, you know, I didn't do the right thing when I told my whopping lie. Um, but it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's very much, it has a very, a very real uh, sense of uh, value in the individual human life. And I think that, that question he poses is, uh, is one we could all pose to ourselves and, and, and make a judgment. But I do think it's worth, you know, currently, I think it's, I definitely think life is worth living. I can imagine uh, when it might not be, that you just open a newspaper and you'll, you'll see many examples of lives that are not worth living. And, you know, you know people who, you know, are terminally ill or whatever, who have reached a point where it's not worth living, um, and uh, it's it's, a, it's a, a, a moment of human judgment, I think, that occurs. And uh, and you know, old old Albert Camus put his finger on it. He also said rather beautifully that it was very it's very important to live life to the point of tears. Yes, well, I didn't know that's, that's exactly. Um, it's, uh, my great motto is carpe diem, seize the day, you know, live and live and savor the present moment. Don't worry about what might happen next year, you know, just, um, and I think that's, you know, these, these, these old ancients knew what they were talking about. And uh, uh, again, it goes to show you that you know, nothing much has changed in, in the human condition in, in several thousand years. So, um, uh, no, I think it's, you, you, you want to find a, a way of, of getting through your short adventure on this small planet. And there are all sorts of um, 
things you can do to, to, to help you on, on, along the journey. William, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Fab, Tam. Brilliant. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tam. All your thinking. It's great. Lovely.